I have only five words for you. From my cold, dead hands. What a wonderful world. I see skies of blue. This is Rumble, and I'm Michael Moore. Welcome, everyone. It's been another one of those weeks. It's it's coming back after lunch, April 20th, 1999, into our production studio. We were making the very first season of our TV series, The Awful Truth, and on the TV set in the um, sort of ping pong room (laughs) that sat by the front door, the TV was on, and there was the, what back then, the term that rarely was used, breaking news. Columbine High in Littleton, Colorado, on the edge of Denver, it has been a horror. That somebody or somebody's inside of Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, had gone in and shot up the school. And the police and the SWAT teams had decided to not go into the school because they didn't know who or what was in there and what kind of firepower they had. And so they remained outside for at least two hours, maybe some say close to three. Um, Of course, back then, we didn't have mass shootings like that. It was something that was fairly new. It's not that we hadn't had mass shootings in our history, and it's not that uh, there hadn't been a lot of death and destruction here in the United States of America over the years. Back in the late 1920s, uh, near Flint, a um, small town, Bath, Michigan, where the treasurer of the school board was upset at uh, some other people on the board were accusing him of some sort of malfeasance with the funds of the school district. At that time, you know, they had these one-room schoolhouses, except this was a very large schoolhouse. It was more than one room, and all the students in the entire school district went to school in this one schoolhouse in Bath. And the very upset, very angry treasurer of the school board had gone in there the night before, planted a bunch of dynamite uh, throughout the basement of the school. And the next morning, once the kids and the teachers were all in there, blew it up. It's the 1920s. Blew it up, and um, close to 50 students and teachers died. So that was the largest school massacre uh, in 1927 in Bath, Michigan, until um, Columbine. Columbine, 12 students and one teacher, and plus the, the two students who were the killers, died there. But the Bath, Bath Massacre had long been forgotten. My grandfather was present there in the hours after the massacre at Bath, Michigan, back in 1927. He was a, a country doctor, is what they called them back then. He had like a, a year of medical school. And they put a call out to all the doctors in the area to please come to Bath. And so doctors from probably a 50-mile radius um, got to Bath, Michigan within a couple of hours. People suffering and, and children bleeding. In addition to the 38 who were killed, Uh, There were another 58 who were injured, limbs hanging from young kids. You know, there weren't ambulances like the way we know them now. There was, there weren't, you know, the nearest hospital back then was far away. So the the doctors arrived, my grandfather arrived arrived and saw the horror of the scene and immediately went to work uh, triaging and trying to, who needed their help first and his help and uh, trying to, You know, a lot of them had bled out probably by then, and they did the best they could do to keep the the others alive and to treat them with with limited medicines and um, things that were available in 1927. 
And, you know, this story was passed on to us uh, as grandkids. Uh, and so we always kind of knew about this. And whenever we drove through Bath, it was always kind of a, as little kids, you know, kind of a creepy feeling. But Columbine happened on April 20th, 1999. And it shocked the nation and it shocked the world. There had never been a shooting like this before at an American high school. Not not to this level. I mean, there, there have obviously been shootings at schools through the years, you know, sadly. But not this. Not this. And I stood there in front of the television set by the ping pong table in our production offices and I was just, I couldn't take my eyes off the TV. What kind of country do we live in? Who are we? Just in my head, these questions just uh, just burning through me. Sick, sick, sick of it all. I said to my fellow filmmakers working on the show, TV show, standing there, all of us watching this. So we have to do something. I don't know what it is. I know we're in the middle of this TV show, but we, um, wow. Yeah, this is what we're capable of, this kind of death and destruction. Of course we are. And if we all don't rise up and do something about this, this is going to happen again and again and again. Because this is who we are, really, at our core. Violence, guns. It's just usually we're used to doing it to other people, whether it's the massacre of the native peoples to take over this land, the violence against Africans, forcing them to come here in chains and build this country for us. I don't know. We had a long, long history of this and of invading other countries who weren't doing our will. <sighs> I just said, I said, listen, I don't know. Well, I know we got to get to work here today, but we've got to do something about this. And I called up the Canadian producers of our show, uh, one of whom was having to, having, he was going to be in New York in a couple of days, and I made a plan to have lunch with him, and I sat down with him on the corner of 85th and Broadway in New York City, and I, I said, listen, I know we're, we're in the middle of this TV series, but uh, we've, this, is, this is who, this is, we have to stop this right now. We have to nip this right in the bud. We need to make a movie. I don't know what it's going to say or do or be or whatever, but, and before I got the next sentence out of my mouth, he goes, done. We'll fund it. Michael Donovan, this guy from Nova Scotia, will fund it. And he told me how, you know, obviously Canadians had been watching us for, for a long time, not quite figuring out why we are the way we are. And I thanked him, and um, very quickly we got to work on a film that would take us three years to make. Because in the middle of it, 9-11 happened. We had to do our series for the two years that we were contracted to do it. We also spent a decent amount of time in the Denver area over that over those years, filming, interviewing, talking to people, running into Marilyn Manson, who was blamed for the these kids committing this atrocity. And um, so I got to know a lot of people in Denver, in Littleton, uh, around the area. Really saw what they, the pain that they went through, we're still going through. And as we know now, um, the mass killings continued in the years after. Uh, most notably at the multiplex, the movie theater in Aurora, uh, which is Littleton is sort of south, south, south suburb of Denver, and Aurora's to the um, to the east. But all around each other, they're all kind of all interconnected there. 
And then, and then this week, on Monday, in the King Super, S-O-O-P-E-R, market, one of those mega markets, it's got a pharmacy, it's got a Starbucks, it's got a grocery store, all this, everything. And a young man, 21 years old, comes in. And not so much spraying bullets, but in a very targeted way, starting out in the parking lot, just starts killing people. He goes to the line of people that are lining up to get their COVID shot, their vaccine, at the pharmacy inside the market, and uh, goes right to the front of the line and, and kills the woman that's at the front of the line. And continues his rampage uh, throughout the, uh, the store. Ten people dead, but he doesn't die. He's in a bit, a little bit of a gun shootout with the police when they when they got there, and the first officer, of course, was killed. God bless him, and just ran right in to try and save lives. Lost his own, but they did kill him. They, I think they there was a bullet that went through his leg, didn't hit anything serious, and they they took him out, put him in the ambulance, took him to the hospital arrested him and here we are once again my friends just seven days before this a guy goes in to three different spas in the Atlanta area and kills eight people six of them Asian women Asian Americans and again he is not killed he's captured but what hasn't really been covered much I've only, I've only really seen it on CNN, is the fact that in the seven days between Atlanta and Boulder, there were a total of seven mass shootings. We call it a mass shooting is defined by law enforcement as uh, the uh, shooting four or more people, not, not counting the perpetrator. So four people are shot and injured and or killed. That makes, that's, according to the definition of law enforcement, that's a mass slaying. We've had seven of those in seven days between Atlanta and Boulder. That's who we are. All over the country, Philly, San Francisco. I think there was one down in Orlando. Violence. We are such a violent people. And yet, I just I want to say this because in making Bowling for Columbine, we decided that, of course, the solution to the, all of this is going to be gun control. And if we just have more laws trying to limit the guns being in the hands of the wrong people, that would fix our problem. That's how we started out making the film. And we thought it'd be interesting to go to Canada, having grown up uh, on the border in Michigan with the Canadians and wondering why didn't they have the same problem we have. And so um, there's a, there's an office in Ottawa. That's their capital uh, called Canada statistics or statistics, Canada. I forget. I don't know if it's in English or French. One word comes before the other there. We discovered a very interesting statistic about the Canadians there's 7 million guns in Canada, over 30 million people with 7 million guns. That's a, I mean, that's a, that's a hell of a ratio. I mean, it's not quite ours. We're usually one-to-one -one here. You know, if we have 300 million people, they think there's about 300 million guns in the country. Now we have 330 million and they're saying there's 350 million guns in this country. But 7 million guns in Canada, when you think about that there, I think the statistics said that there were approximately... 8 million households in Canada. Well, that's almost a gun per household if you averaged it out that way. And we couldn't believe it. We like, well, you know, I thought they had gun control up here. And of course, then it was explained to us that hunting is the number one sport in Canada. More people participate in hunting than play hockey. We're like, you know, our minds are being blown by this, right? We can't even believe what we're hearing. And with all these guns, and yes, they have they have good gun laws. 
uh, you, it's very hard to get a handgun in Canada. You can go to a, a sporting range and shoot handguns. They, they, you can, you know, use it there for the afternoon. But very hard to get a handgun. But hunting rifles, you know, I mean, yes, you still have to register it. And you have to go through, you have to, I think, prove you know how to use it. You've got to commit to locking it up so the kids can't get at it, things like that. But still, there, <laughs> there were all these guns in Canada and hardly any gun murders. At that time, there were over 11,000 gun murders in the U.S., um, and there were 165 in Canada. So you can do the math there. You can see that there's something wrong. Why aren't the Canadians killing more of each other? Why aren't they more like us? They seem like us. Yeah. <laughs> they watch the same violent movies and same violent TV shows as we watch, and... Um, you know, they, the culture, I mean, the culture is different. If you live on the border, you know that. But you, nonetheless, the culture is also very similar. And they just don't reach for the gun when they get upset. So that changed the whole focus of the film. And I'm going to have with me here very shortly one of the parents of the students who were killed. At Columbine. He's in the movie, Bowling for Columbine. That was the movie we set out to make and spent three years making it. And his name is Tom Mauser. We had a lot of respect and still do for him. The tragedy that he and his family suffered through. And he became an activist on this issue. I've not talked to him in a number of years now. I'm sorry that the events in Colorado this week are now going to bring us back together on this podcast. But before um, he joins us, I just want to say a few things because the solution here is not what we think it is. And we've made this point in the film. There's something wrong with us as Americans. And we started to explore that through the rest of the film. Now, let me just jump in and interrupt myself here and tell you that in many ways, what is wrong with us isn't what it appears to be. For instance, according to the Washington Post, we are far from being a nation of gun nuts because 78% of us do not own a gun. 78% of all Americans don't have a single goddamn weapon. 22% have guns, and the vast majority of them are hunters, are people who use them for sport. There's, There are those, obviously, who feel that they need it for self-protection. In the same Washington Post article, it pointed out, though, and here's the scary part of the statistic, that half of all the guns in this country, so let's say, that, let's say there's 300 million guns in this country, just to do the math, 300 million guns in the United States of America, 150 million of them are owned by just 3% of our population. So 78% of us don't own a gun, but 3% of us own 150 million guns. Whew. Okay, so do the math on that 3%. You know, these are adults, obviously, kids. But that's what, 7, 8 million people own 150 million guns. So that means, on average... Each of these huge gun owners each own at least 20 guns? What do they need 20 guns for? <sighs> and the, the perpetrators, the, the, the killers these, of these mass murders, they aren't always who you think they are. It's, these aren't punks. The killer of the children at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Colorado, 20 children killed and six staff at that elementary school. 20 children, mostly all first graders, about six years old. Who went in there and committed that crime? <sighs> A guy in his 20s. A guy. Some guy who just shot right through the doors and the windows and entered that school. It 
it's funny if the suspect is of a different color, of a different socioeconomic class. We learn a lot about that and we hear a lot about it. But the killer of 20 first graders was the son of the vice president of General Electric. They never mention that in the paper. Why is that? You know, as much as we talk about, and, you know, this is, they're, all, they're discussing this already in terms of what happened in Boulder, that the killer may have a mental problem. Well, of course, anybody who would do this has a mental problem. I don't think that should, we should just make that clear. But the right, Republicans, NRA, they really want to focus on this mental health issue. And yes, we have a big mental health problem in this country, and we need to deal with it. But <laughs> this 20 something year old who, killed the 26 people at Sandy Hook. He had not one, but two shrinks because he was on the gold plan. His father's, his father's the vice president of General Electric. He had the best friggin' health care, best health insurance anybody's going to have in the United States of America. And even with the two shrinks, that wasn't enough. So it's something else. It's always something else. And we do, we want an easy answer. We want to know quickly. And we don't ever really want to think about what else could this be? I don't know. I don't know if we really do want to know the why. The guy on the second and top floor there of the Las Vegas hotel killed 50-some people and, and injured hundreds. He was a multimillionaire. Did you know that? Yeah. It's a multimillionaire. So it's not always exactly who you think it is. And their reasons for doing this aren't always exactly clear. But I think, I think if we're ever going to solve this problem, that we need to look at this differently and we need to look for new solutions. Because the old way, it isn't working. Thoughts and prayers you know, let's let's close the loophole and the background checks. This is not going to fix our fundamental problem that we as Americans have when it comes to violence. That is our problem. And you know me. I mean, I hate to be a Debbie Downer here because I do try to. I am an optimistic person. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing all this if I didn't believe we could fix things and make it better. But I have to tell you, my friends. Uh, after this week of seven mass shootings, the two large ones bookending the week, Atlanta and Boulder, uh, maybe, maybe this can't be fixed. Maybe this is just one of these things we have to learn to live with because this is who we are. You know, you if you live in the lowlands of Bangladesh, the annual you know, monsoon season, the waters rise, half the country is below sea level, and thousands drown. And because the way the earth is there, that's they have to live with it, they have to deal with it, they have to try to save their lives, but it doesn't always work. Maybe this is just our, our curse. Maybe this is the human ecology that we have to live. This is our DNA. This is America. And get ready for the next mass shooting tomorrow, the next day. Yeah, sometimes it's it's four people in Detroit. It's uh, three people in Milwaukee. Um, it's five people in Seattle. But there may not be a fix to this because we would ultimately have to fix ourselves. We would ultimately have to be a nation that was not inclined to use violence as a solution to a problem. We would have to be a country that had universal free health care so that anybody who wasn't feeling well, somebody who needed to check in to a hospital to see a psychiatrist, a psychologist, we're not that country. Our attitude is, hey man, you can't afford it. Tough. Tough it out. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Oh yeah, we got Obamacare, but that still leaves about 30 million people without health insurance. So 
uh, we're not we're not entirely committed to this, and so somebody that needs help can't get help. Then we suffer the consequences, and the next shooter goes into the next supermarket or the next pharmacy or the next library or the next school, the next church, the next black church. Suck it up. Live with it. That's America. I don't like saying that, and I don't want to live in that country. So we're going to have to figure something else out, aren't we? Because these damn Republicans certainly aren't going to pass anything. They're not going to join with us on anything. We don't really need them. And if Joe Biden and the Democrats in the Senate have any kind of guts, they will bypass this filibuster. They will deal with it and get these laws passed that we need, including this one. And all the other ones we need. And the people who have all these guns, who love their guns, and are afraid that we're going to take their guns away from them, they need, they need to cool the fuck down. You're a hunter. You are you like to shoot guns on the range. Have at it. Nobody wants your guns. But if you've got 20 guns, or if you've got magazines that hold 30, 50, 100 bullets, well, we'd like to talk to you about that. Just see what you're thinking here. You're a menace. A potential menace. Because you don't need that kind of firepower for your own self-defense. And you certainly don't need it to kill Bambi. Somehow, some way, we're going to have to fix this. But we may not be able to. Tell me that's not true. Tell me there's a way. Because we certainly, and I'm telling you, the people who are listening to this podcast right now from around the world, they're just shaking their heads. They're like, you Americans, you're just going to keep doing this. You stopped doing it during the pandemic, yeah. And then all of a sudden when things start to get back to normal, spring break is happening, Restaurants are reopening and mass shootings are back. Because that is as American as apple pie. And this poor, this poor sick individual who killed these 10 people, 21 years old, he was born on April 17th, 1999. Three days before the Columbine Massacre. And now some 21, 22 years later, he walks in to a suburban Denver supermarket and kills 10 people. He injures no one because that kind of gun, it's meant to kill and only kill shoots all those bullets and there's no injuries. Nobody ended up in the hospital. If he shot you, you ended up in the morgue. That kind of gun should not be allowed in civilian society. The police shouldn't have it. The citizens shouldn't have it. And we can talk about the military some other time, but my friends, this is insanity thinking about what I was going to say and, and do tonight on this podcast I I thought I need to talk to Tom Mauser I need to talk to the man who was really the conscience of bowling for Columbine and so I said to Basil do you think I know this is like so no notice and I'm, I'm sure he's having his own week dealing with this and thinking about his son lost his life at Columbine. Uh, but maybe let's, give, let's give him a call and see if he, he would come on and spend a few minutes with me. Um, and, and he agreed to. He said yes. And, um, and he's with us here. In the days and the weeks and the years since Tom Mauser's 15-year-old son, Daniel, was taken from him 
at the Columbine High School massacre on April 20th, 1999, Tom Mauser has spoken and marched and organized, written, gotten laws passed, and sadly been called upon to comfort parents who have also lost their children in this most cruel American epidemic of school shootings. In addition to his tireless advocacy, he is a longtime public servant, having worked for decades for the Colorado Department of Public Transportation. I just want to uh, read you a quote from a scene in Bowling for Columbine, where he spoke on the stage in front of the state capitol in Denver shortly after uh, the Columbine uh, killings. He said to the people gathered, I am here today because my son Daniel would want me to be here today. If my son Daniel was not one of the victims, he would be here with me today. Something is wrong in this country when a child can grab a gun so easily and shoot a bullet into the middle of a child's face as my son experienced. Something is wrong. But the time has come to come to understand that a Tech-9 semi-automatic 30 bullet weapon like that that killed my son is not used to kill deer. It has no useful purpose. It is time to address this problem. And then in the film, I speak to Tom and he says to me, just out of the blue, poses a question to me that altered the direction, not just of the film, but of my way of looking at violence and specifically American violence. And this is what, this is what Tom said to me. But that, but that to me brings up an important question. Then what is so different about Americans? Are we homicidal in nature? Because in Europe, in Australia, most other free world countries, they don't have this. They don't have people who snap and go on murderous rampages. Well, no, they're just like us. I mean, they have the occasional person that snaps and kills a lot of people. Or how about a British soccer rat? Those aren't Quakers there. <laughs> Every time that I bring up comparisons with other free world countries, what I hear is, oh, our culture is so different. We're so different. And as you said, they have violent video games. They have violent movies. They have alienated youth. They, like us, don't have prayer in schools. <laughs> what is so radically different? What is it about us? What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? I don't know. You know what? Somewhere in this question lies not just the answer, but the solution. My sincere hope is that that is true. We have now with us Mr. Tom Mauser. Tom, how are you, sir? Good. How are you, Michael? I'm, uh, well, you know... I'm sad and mad that I have to deal with this again. Again. So, Tom, first of all, I mean, just how are you doing this week with this? I mean, it's got to obviously trigger all those feelings and seeing innocent people lose their lives. Yeah, it does. It you know, it it, it brings it back to you, especially you know when I start doing a, a an interview with the media and talking about Daniel. Yeah, it it, it triggers some of that. It was, you know, it was it's especially difficult because I got a phone call from a friend whose daughter was in that store when it happened. They're, they're good friends of ours and our daughters are friends. And she, she didn't, she wasn't shot, but I know that she's going to be traumatized. And just as so many Americans are by these senseless, senseless things. Over, over these last um, 20 22 years, I mean, you have devoted a good chunk of your life uh, speaking out against this, trying to get laws passed you, around, you go around the country, I see you on TV. Um, I mean, you have been tireless and fearless on this issue and, and, and standing up to the NRA and to the gun lobby. You know, have we, have we failed? Have we failed at this? Have we, 
Because is this ever really going to change? Is there just something in our DNA that won't let us be released from the grip of, as Americans, that this is just a thing now? It's been a thing for at least a couple of decades, and I'm out of ideas in the sense of what is it we can do to see that this happens as little as possible. Maybe you can never, ever get rid of everything, but... But, you know, I guess I, I'm calling you tonight for some help here in the, in the sense that um, I feel like I and my friends, we've given it a lot, and, and yet here we are talking about it again, more people dead, and a, and a nation confused and asking why. Yeah. Well, you asked the question, uh, you know, have, have we failed? Well, our generation has. We, we clearly have failed um, you know, the following generations. It's, it's really up to those generations. Not to say that we, we don't keep trying to do something and we, we don't help them ask the question of themselves. But yeah, we, we somewhat really failed. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. Otherwise, I guess I wouldn't be, be doing this. Otherwise, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. But, you know, I'm, I'm still asked, as I have been this week, well, are you shocked by this? Is, is it is it shocking to you? This is still going on, and my response is, no, no, I'm I'm saddened by it, and I'm shocked that it's happened. But no, I'm not surprised by it because we really haven't done very much to deal with it. We, we we haven't. We we really need a young generation, in particular, to say, we've had enough of this. We don't want to live like this. This has to change. This is cultural change. We really need serious, serious cultural change um, if we want to see anything improve. And cultural, we cultural, yeah, cultural meaning what makes us Americans? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is somewhat <laughs> ingrained here. Otherwise, why would we have so much more of this happening than, than nations that are like us? It, it's a gun culture. It's, I think, it, it's a violent culture. Uh, I think it's also a culture... You know, that, that we're so individualized in this country. We don't look, we're not a nation that deals with, you know, thinks about community very much. We, we're so much about the individual and what it is about me uh, and, and not, so we don't really reach out to people very well. You know, uh, uh, our bigger problem, you know, frankly, is the day-to-day shootings, not as much as the, we're all shocked by the, the mass shootings. But they really make up a smaller percentage of of the deaths. You know, a lot of these are domestic. Um, you know, they're killing people that they know, and I think uh, I, I really think that a lot of it is because we're not reaching out to the people who, who who are the perpetrators. You know, these these people who were lost in life. You're on your own, buddy. You know, we we really aren't very good at at comforting other people and dealing with other other people who who were troubled. I, I, and then we also, I, I think, have a cultural thing of, um, of entitlement and revenge and getting at people. You know, the people, especially in the case of, of domestic shootings and uh, the mass shootings, these people are really mad at other people and they're going to take them down with them. They're not satisfied to end their own miserable lives. They have to take somebody with them. What is it? about us, here I go asking the question of you again, but what is it about us that that has so many people like this that behave this way and think this way? I'll I'll ask you the same question I asked you 22 years ago. What is it? What is it? (laughs) Well, I I think it's entitlement. I think we have a lot of people, and I think we see this in other political uh, ways, of people who feel some entitlement to certain things. And they don't like being told they can't have that. So, they, you know, they have, they have a miserable life. They've been bullied or they didn't get where they wanted to go. And they're mad as hell and they're going to take it out on somebody. You know, I, I think the countries that, that are more community-minded and, and more concerned about the community and their nation as a whole, I don't think they have as many people like that. They don't have people who were just disposed of and 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 uh i mean you could even argue that that's happened in the political field 
you know, how we how we elected the last presidents. You know, a lot of people who felt I don't like what the world has done to me, and uh, I'm I'm going to select someone who uh, who reflects that, <laughs> and and who and who speaks for me. Um, yeah, there's just something about this nation. You know, I, I, I'm not saying all people are like that. Obviously, the, I'm, I'm suggesting that some of the people who who turn to violence are that way. But we really don't have many systems set up to help those people to deal with them. We tell them, hey, you're on your own. Because something has happened since Columbine. And frankly, I, know, I didn't think I'd live to see the day that this would happen. But the NRA, the National Rifle Association, in the last year or two, has been neutered in many ways. And they have had to file for bankruptcy. They are coming apart at the seams. There are actually less members than there were before. There are, you know, the, the use of guns has actually been going down and down and down each year in terms of the number of hunters, that, you know, just basic gun use is down. That's right. Uh, and I, I said before you came yeah. on here that it's now at a point where 78% of all Americans do not own a gun. So some progress, I think, has been made here. And and our greatest foe here, the NRA, the gun lobby, they're back on their heels. And they are, uh, they are not doing well right now. And this may be, Tom, I don't know, maybe this is the moment. Maybe the window is opened. Maybe there's a, a chance. You know, I heard the President of the United States yesterday say, ban all assault weapons. Wow. That was, that was a shock. I was surprised to hear that, frankly. Democrats used to be frightened of the NRA, right? Remember that? We, remember back in the day, right. you try, you couldn't get, you certainly couldn't get Republicans to be on your side here, but you couldn't get Democrats. They were afraid to take a position. They thought that's the death of you at the at the polls if you come out against the NRA. Right. That's gone now. Now the NRA is the one that's frightened. The Democrats are the last two elections, congressional elections. There's a great uh, statistic here of the the NRA endorsed candidates were the ones that were losing. The ones who didn't get the endorsement of the NRA, they won. That's how the Democrats were able to take over Congress in 2018. I don't see politicians yeah. putting ads out there anymore, you know, walking th- like John Kerry and, you know, walking through the fields with a gun and shooting ducks and shooting deer and shooting things. But are they going to change their votes? No, I'm, I'm not convinced they are. They are still lockstep with the gun lobby. The NRA may be weaker, but the gun lobby in general and the gun industry, it is still an industry. And indeed, as you said, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're seeing sales go down. I mean, what, what you see in sales now is a lot of people buying extra guns, even more yeah. guns rather than, you know, individuals. Um, but, but, the, but those people are still going to vote down anything. They're going to use the filibuster to defeat Anything that comes before the Senate. Well, then we have to get rid of the filibuster. I agree. You know, when it gets when it gets to the point where over ninety percent of Americans support universal background checks, strong background checks, and Mitch McConnell can say no, we're not even going to hear it when he was in power, and now he's not in not in the majority, but he'll use the filibuster to kill it too. There is something seriously wrong in this country when that's the way we run things. It's basically a tyranny by the minority. And we can't let that happen. That's not democracy. We have to use this particular case as, as uh, evidence number one why we have to get rid of the, the filibuster. Forget about the other issues. When 90% of Americans can't get something that they want, there's and, something wrong. You've got to change that right. system. Otherwise, it's not a democracy. I mean, this is, I'm glad you've brought right. this up because this is, if we could get rid of this hurdle, if Joe Biden would come out forcefully against the filibuster and just call it what it is, it's not democracy. Democracy is majority rules, 51 votes in the Senate. That's all you need. We've got them, you know, and that should be the end of that. And 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 yep. if he's got some people like Senator Manchin and Senator Cinema wavering, geez, you know you're old enough to remember what 
You know, back in the day, the Lyndon Johnsons and the Tip O'Neills and whatever, they brought them in. Closed the door. Yep. 15 minutes later, they walked yep. out of the door. <laughs> They're voting for the bill. Mm, yeah. Well, and you also ask them, how do the people in your state feel about universal background checks? With 90% of the Americans, you can't tell me that in West Virginia, Arizona, it's only 10% or even only 40%. No, it's, it's, it's more than 50%, a lot more than 50%. So why, why, why are you not supporting it? Some of them are still afraid. We, 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 have, to, we, we have to get people to, uh, to speak up more and say this is ridiculous. Anybody in the last two days who said, you know, how bad they feel about what happened in Boulder or or um, has said something to me about the filibuster or whatever, I said, I, I, I say this now, and I, I will now say it till I'm blue in the face. Did you make the call? What call? Did you call the Senate, your senators? Did you call Manchin? Did you call the Senate switchboard? You know, I, I say this number whenever I can. And I'll, I'll say it right now, and, and folks who are listening, I'll put it right here on my page. You don't have to get a pencil out or whatever. Do they still make pencils? Uh, 202-224-3121. If you don't know who your senator is when the operator uh, answers the call, uh, just tell him or her uh, the state you live in, and they'll connect you to, to one of the two senators, and then call back and talk to the other one or talk to their, their aides. Somebody will talk to you. They want to know how you feel about this. Yeah. I mean, sir, is there, is there, you know, if there's 100,000 people listening to me right now, if there's 200,000 people, all you've got to do is dial 202-224-3121. Boom. 15 to 30 seconds of your time. Let me re- reflect that with that on a, uh, uh, with an example. Back when we were trying to close the gun show loophole in Colorado before it went on the ballot, Senator who was lead, who's trying to get the bill passed in the state legislature to close the gun show loophole. He was at a meeting and a woman asked him, are we going to close that loophole? And he said, ma'am, it's not looking like it. She said, why not? Why can't we get this closed? And he said, ma'am, who's, who was your, um, who was your state representative and Senator? And she said, oh, I'm not sure. And he said, ma'am, that's why it's not going to pass. Yeah. That is what it comes down to until people, more people speak up and, and make their voices heard and encourage their neighbors to do that and get involved and not count on somebody else doing it. It's not going to change. Too many Americans think that this issue is uh, the, the people advocating on this issue are extremists, you know, on both the pro gun side, uh, the, the zealots, as well as the uh, gun violence prevention people. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't consider myself an extremist at all. I do think the people on the other side are extremists, and they're holding us back. And we and we have to. We already outnumber them, but now we've got to. We've got to outshout them. They're very good at yeah. shouting. They're very good at, at intimidating. We have to play their ball game. And remember that we're the majority. In this case, the ninety percent majority. Yes. Yes. There was somebody I saw on, on the cable news here yesterday. Um, I don't know if it was either your congressman out there or somebody said they, you went to some inauguration. I don't know if it was in Colorado or in D.C., but he said, this is, the, this is, I think the reporter was saying that Daniel would be his age. They would be of the same age right now had Daniel lived. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, my God. And what, what did we all lose as a result of that? What did we lose out on? Who would he have been? What would he have done? How much better would the world have been? You know, I frankly try. I try not to think of that. No, it's, it's 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 too difficult. I'm sorry to bring it up, but I I want to. I want you to know that you're not the only one that has to think about this, and we do think we we think about you. We all of us who worked on the film. Um, this you have uh, been with us all these 22 years, and we're all as committed as we were before. We just don't necessarily have the answer. We have some answers that can maybe explain who we are as Americans, but but the actual the path to success to end this once and for all. Well, I know what happens when there's no filibuster because we'll immediately have whatever laws we need passed. 
but that will require a massive uprising, the American people calling that Senate switchboard number and demanding, demanding that these laws get passed. That's right. I want to believe right now this is our moment. Maybe Am I crazy thinking that? This possibly could be so many times. I thought for sure after Sandy Hook, you know, and I, and I, I interviewed a, uh, some of the parents after Sandy Hook, and I was going to do something, and I, I thought, you know, what's what the thing is here? We during Vietnam, the nightly news showed us, actually showed footage of our soldiers being killed in Vietnam. That did more to end that war. People saw that at dinner time, and were horrified. Bring the troops home. That became the the rallying cry across the country. I think if, yep. if I, I think if people saw the crime scene photos from Sandy Hook, that would be the end of that. That would be the end of the NRA. Um, because yeah, because I know nobody wants to look at that, but sometimes you know, like Emmett Till, when he was killed by the white supremacists back in the fifties. Yep. His mother. Very sent, bra- yeah. Very, very brave mother. Brave mother. They sent the, the body back home here, I think to New York. And she insisted on an open casket so the whole world could see what they did to her little boy. And it was so horrific and it shocked the nation. And it was a turning point in popular support for yeah. civil rights legislation, for Martin Luther King, for and it didn't you know it didn't happen overnight, but somebody had to do it, and and her doing that. So, th- two or three of the Sandy Hook parents agreed with me, and um, you know we haven't done anything with it yet because I don't want any trauma to be triggered from the family members. But America needs to take a look in the mirror, in the mirror. Are those kids piled into the closet in Sandy Hook with close range, the gunmen blowing their heads off, blowing half their faces off? I think if America, if they would stop turning away from this and look at the actual humanity of it, the damage, it would be so sickening. Yes, it's, it's going to be sickening, but we need to be we need to be sickened by this. We do. And. And not just forget about it. Ten days after Boulder, forget about it till the next one. I'm sorry to be so upset about this. But, oh, no. but, but that is the reality. Unfortunately, in America, the, the news cycle is so short. People will, will forget. It's, it's almost like the thing we have to count on is the fact that it happens so much and so often. You know, this is the Boulder shooting. There was the Aurora theater shooting. The... The massacre in Charleston. Now every city is going to have, you know, some terrible shooting, and maybe that will lead people to say, "Um, maybe, maybe we need to try something else." But but with with the news cycle this short, I'm sorry, uh, most people, other than in Colorado, are largely going to forget this, and they're going to forget Atlanta because it's too painful for them, and they don't know. They feel like they don't know what they can do. Well, we have a right to bear arms. Oh, gee, what can you do? Oh, there's crazy people, you know, John Kennedy from Louisiana saying, you know, oh, it's it's idiot. We need idiot control. I mean, mm. come on, folks. Yeah. Yeah. When, when it happens this much, you can't just write it off like that. But people don't want to deal with it. I, I think also there's too much reliance on those of us who are the victims to speak up. We need more ordinary people, more people saying, I don't want to be that next Tom Mauser. I don't want mm. to be that next victim. Mm. I'm going to do something now. I can't tell you how many you know, other, other victims I've come across who've said, I'm sorry I didn't get involved in this before now. Well, <laughs> and so am I. Um, you, you can't wait until it impacts you directly. You have to assume that it, it, you could be the next one or your neighbor, someone you love, and that's ought to be motivation to do something about it. You mentioned earlier that you felt that our generation, the older generation, has failed, um, uh, and we've failed our younger generations. How do you feel, especially watching what happened after the shooting at Parkland, how they organized that massive march, 
uh, in D.C. and how they've stayed active. I, I mean, I've been really impressed with teenagers, high school students, college students um, on this issue. Maybe, maybe what we haven't been able to do, they'll be able to do it. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think that they really can set, set a different course and, and say, we don't want to live like this. This, this is craziness. You know, hey, if, 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 if we can put up with uh, all these drills that, that are uh, so disturbing, then you know what? Then the NRA and its people, they ought to be able to cope with background checks and waiting periods and not having an assault, uh, assault rifle. They've had to put up with so much. And I think they can bring about change. I really, I really think yeah, they can bring I about agree. change. I agree. I went down there to Parkland a um, couple weeks after the massacre there to see if I could help the kids and and uh, whatever they needed. And um, I, I, I think I mentioned the term, you know, like they're considered Gen Z, Generation Z, or whatever. And they said, no, no, don't call us that. I said, well, what, what do you want to be called? What, are, what do you call yourselves? And, and the young girl said, we call ourselves the Columbine generation because everybody in this room, she said, and look, looking around the room, every one of us was either in our mother's bellies when Columbine happened or born shortly after or shortly before. And it really hit me. I said, really? I mean, you guys, this is what you call yourselves this. Yes. That's, in fact, we want you, the adults, to know that because you gave us this world. You make us have to go through these active shooter drills the way we used to go through tornado drills when we were in school. We've, we've known nothing else but the fear that anybody could walk into the classroom at any time and kill us. That's our whole life. Yeah. We are not Gen Z, she says. We are the Columbine generation. I said, oh, wow. Man, I just wanted to apologize. I'm sorry. This is the world you've been handed. This should have been fixed long ago. That you would have to be identified with the massacre into which you were born that year. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you have that. You share that hope that this generation is going to do something, is doing something. You know, one of the encouraging things that happens to me is when I get a, when I get a YouTube message or um, an email from a young person who said they, they, they read about or, or you know, saw a video of Daniel and they wanted to write to me. These are, when it's a kid who wasn't even born then and they're taking the time to express uh, you know, express their condolences. That to me is so encouraging because they're they're willing to look at what something happened in the past and realize how that ties into today and how it's still a problem. Um, I, I I am so encouraged when I hear from young people. Yes, yes, I am too. I um maybe we'll just leave it on that that uh, therein lies the hope. But I want everybody listening to this to call that switchboard number, the U.S. Senate, uh, to end the filibuster and pass uh, this gun legislation, 202-224-3121. This is not a telethon. We're not raising money. I'm asking you to be, please, be a citizen and call. Tom, I'm so grateful that you had this time uh, to spend with us tonight. I hope you're doing well. Thanks. It's, it is people like you that are going to help change this world. You've already done it in many ways. You've changed many minds. Keep at it if you can. But like you said, I don't think this is the burden that the victims have to carry. I think this is on us, on all the rest of us. If we call ourselves citizens of this democracy, then we have to start acting like it. Tom Mauser, thank you. You're welcome. Be Thanks, well. Michael. Yeah, and say hi to your family and uh, tell them we wish them well. we Will do. Take care. Uh, take care. Bye-bye. Well, that was... Um, Really something catching up with Tom again. And uh, so happy to see that he's still working on this, but we can't obviously leave it up to him and the other victims, as he said, 
this is something we have to do. Hey, um, there's a few other things I just want to catch up with you on before we finish. But before I do that, uh, I want to take a moment to thank our amazing underwriter for this particular episode, Amazon Studios. Those are the film people there. And they have an amazing film out right now uh, that has been nominated for the Academy Awards. It's called Time. Time was directed by Garrett Bradley, and it is the most honored documentary of the year. In addition to its uh, Oscar nomination, it's been nominated for Best Documentary by the Independent Spirit Awards, Outstanding Producer of a Documentary by the Producers Guild of America, and all this is on top of awards that Time has already won, from Sundance to the IDA Documentary Awards, the New York Film Critics, Los Angeles Film Critics, the National Society of Film Critics, Doc NYC, Great Documentary Festival, all these awards. And, and they're all so richly deserved. This is, this is definitely one of the great documentaries of the last few years. And its director, Garrett Bradley, this is her feature documentary debut. And I think that she has accomplished something very profound. She's made both a beautiful love story that's also a powerful film about America's cruel and racist prison industrial complex. I know you've never heard those words in the same sentence before, love story and racist prison industrial complex, but that that's the genius of this film. It tells the story of a black woman. Her name is Fox Rich, and she has spent the last two decades campaigning for the release of her husband, Rob G. Rich, who is serving a 60-year sentence for a robbery committed back in the early 90s. Garrett paints a mesmerizing portrait of resilience and radical love that's necessary to prevail over all these years of separation, separation that's caused by this country's mass incarceration epidemic. So, my friends, please do yourself a favor. Watch Time on Prime. And if you don't have Prime, if you don't have a Prime membership, then just get a free trial just to watch this film. You know, you can do that. It's fine. They want you. They want you to see this film. So just sign up for a free membership. And I'll have a link to the film right here on the description page of this episode. And I want to thank, of course, Amazon Studios and the good people there, the good movie people there for supporting this podcast, for supporting my voice and supporting the work of talented filmmakers like Garrett Bradley and her excellent Oscar nominated film, Time. I also want to thank another great underwriter of this episode uh, here today, and that is SignalWire. And there's been a lot of talk lately about, you know, all of us <laughs> trying to get back to normal. We want to get back to normal pretty soon. I know. Listen, we're all eager to get out of the house. I'm going to talk about that in a second here. We want to get our lives going again, and we really want to go back to normal like we had it. Some of us don't want to go back to the old normal. And the new normal that's been created during the pandemic it hasn't really been so great on a number of levels. Think of how hard it's been just to communicate with each other and the ways that we've had to cobble together some sort of communication system so that we can work with each other. And yet when it's come to doing this very thing, whether it's our kids trying to do it because they've had to be going to school while they're home, or whether it's you trying to work with your colleagues at work, whether it's maybe it's your nonprofit that you're part of, your food co-op, whatever it is, all of us have said during this year, there's got to be a better way to do this, to communicate collectively with each other. Well, there is. And SignalWire was built for this moment. You know the other methods of, you know, how we all are on our screens and we have all the other people we're working with there on the screen. And it's, yeah, you know, it's okay, but it hasn't really been what, you know, especially if you want some quality. If you want great video quality and great audio. So, SignalWire, they figured this out. You've got to check them out. It's easy to use, and it enables quick, informal, and unscheduled interactions. The times have changed, and the way we do business with each other is changing, and that's why now is a great time to get on board with SignalWire. Sign up before April 30th at SignalWire, SignalWire, all one word, dot com, and use the code MORE. That's my last name. And SignalWire... Well, okay, get this. This is, this is no BS here. SignalWire will buy lunch for your first team meeting on SignalWire, on your screen. 
All you got to do is go to signalwire.com and be sure and check the terms and conditions of, of this, but they'll buy your lunch for your first team meeting. So don't forget signalwire.com. Use the code more M O O R E signalwire.com. Thank you very much. Signalwire for supporting my voice and supporting this podcast and giving me the chance to encourage people to use something new and cool and good. So anyways, again, it was great having Tom Mauser on to talk about uh, the continuing uh, roadshow of American violence uh, and uh, the sad, sad continuation of these mass shootings. Like I said before, the time we spent in Denver and Littleton and Colorado making bowling for Columbine, it affected all of us. And uh, it, it was actually, it was 18 years ago this week where we all went to the Academy Awards because we were nominated for Best Documentary. And, uh, and well, actually, why don't we just, we have the audio of uh, Diane Lane opening the envelope. Why don't we just, we'll just play this. And you're, what's gonna, you have to understand the context of this. It's the fifth night of the Iraq War. And, uh, and walking uh, in there into the Kodak Theater was a weird, ex- weird experience. A lot of us thought maybe we shouldn't be going to an Oscar ceremony five days into this horrific war. But um, Bowling for Columbine, if you've seen the film, if you haven't, um, you can go here on my podcast page. We've, we've put it up for free here uh, for this week. Uh, just um, just watch it if you haven't, or watch it again if you haven't seen it in uh, the last 15 years or so. Um, but uh, but I'm going to play I'm going to play for you right now the Oscar uh, the Oscar moment and the um, the chaos that ensued. And the Oscar goes to <sighs> Bowling for Columbine. <laughs> This is the first Academy Award and nomination for Michael Moore and Michael Donovan. On uh, behalf of our producers, Kathleen Glenn and Michael Donovan from Canada, um, I'd like to thank the Academy for this. I've invited uh, my fellow documentary nominees on the stage with us. And we would like to, they are here, they are here in solidarity with me because we like nonfiction. We like nonfiction and we live in fictitious times. We live in a time where we have fictitious election results that elects a fictitious president. We, we live in a time where we have a man sending us to war for fictitious reasons, whether it's the fictition of duct tape or the fictitious of orange alerts. We are against this war, Mr. Bush. Shame on you, Mr. Bush. Shame on you. And any time you've got the Pope and the Dixie Chicks against you, your time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, I gotta tell you, that was the uh, security had to get me out of there uh, pretty quick. But it was, a, it was a great night and a great moment, and a lot more people saw the film as a result of it and got talking about this issue of we as violent people. Still talking about it all these uh, years later, but uh, uh, check out the film. And also here on the podcast page, there's a beautiful little tribute that Tom and his family did for Daniel Mauser. Uh, so maybe maybe check that out uh, too. And promise me that you'll make that call to the United States Senate. Mean a lot. Finally, on the podcast on the episode back on Tuesday of this week. I told you that uh, that was uh, the day that the doctor said that the 
my vaccine shots are fully integrated into my body and, and effective, and I could easily uh, go outside with a mask, uh, keep my social distance, whatever. And I was going to come back today and tell you all about it, how it went, but I didn't do it and leave the house here. I woke up, I was going to do it, and then this thing happened in Boulder, and man, it just kind of, I didn't want to talk about my liberation day, on a day when so many more people lost their lives to something that we've spent all this time on, and what seems like to no avail. So, I'm still going to, I'm going to go out, don't worry, I'm, I'll uh, record some audio or whatever, I'll let you know, uh, well, it'll be sometime soon, I hope. What is this? All 380, 382 days now? Is it? Jeez. That I've been inside my apartment. So um, I'm hoping to get out and uh, let you know about that. But thanks. People I know you're looking for me on Facebook Live or whatever, but uh, it just it wasn't, wasn't the right moment. Let's just say that, okay? And uh, leave it there. But, uh, but, but we will do this um, very soon. All right, my friends, that's it for today here on Rumble. Thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for joining in to try and stop this madness with gun violence in this country and trying to stop who we are and hopefully become a better people. It's possible, right? I believe it's possible. All right, be well. This is Rumble. And I'm Michael Moore. Mother Superior jumped the gun. Mother Superior jumped the gun. Mother Superior jumped the gun.